द वे फॉरवर्ड इज थोड़ा बहुत बहुत स्वागत है मैं थोड़ा होस्ट हरजोत सिंह पिछले हफ्त असी प्रेजिडेंट ट्रंप की प्रेजिडेंसी बारे गल करना शुरू किया इस हफ्ते असी प्रेजिडेंट ट्रंप की परफॉर्मेंस की गल करा फॉरन पॉलिसी में अज असी इनवाइट किया है साढ़े चीफ इंटरैशनल पोलिटिकल एंड बिजनेस कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटर सरदार गुरशेर सिंह गिल जी ने गुरशेर थोड़ा बहुत बहुत स्वागत है Thank you, Arjun. Uh, Gusher, thanks for taking out the time to speak with us. Gusher, today we will discuss the foreign policy of President Trump. The foreign policy of China is one of the most important factors in foreign policy. This is why China is one of the most important factors in foreign policy. इस करके उन्होंने पॉलिसी को समझने लिए चाइना को समझना बहुत जरूरी है सानू तुम प्लीज दसो कि की सोच रहा है की चल रहा है इसलिए चाइना की पॉलिसी विच विद रिस्पेक्ट टू इट्स नेबरिंग कंट्रीज एंड अराउंड द वर्ल्ड so you know harjot the way i think is um, you know there is no standard policy of trump administration right now uh, you know when it relates to you know china whether it's economic or geopolitical or asia pack as such i think that you know what's the the the, the um, when i look at the international policy of this administration i think some of the things they have done well uh, in terms of tariffs you know which is uh, obviously has escalated the trade war with china uh, you know when it comes to uh, the neighboring countries when it comes to uh, you know china trying to acquire more land or you know more you know space in the sea the south china sea which is a disputed region um, or india per se um, you know whether it's uh, japan vietnam um, uh, you know uh, india and um, you know some of the other um, um, you know uh, nations around the world specifically in the pacific region um, also australia um, you know there's a, there's a long standing dispute going on for that territory and and i don't think so there is a standard policy at place right now um i think that's a mess because we've been distracted with so many things of lately um you know for example covid um nato has been the other one and uh, you know the trade war in itself is is a big distraction as well Mm-hmm. Uh, Gushir, you know, before we uh, talk at more length about China's uh, policy vis-a-vis U.S. and Trump's policy vis-a-vis China, uh, let, let's try and understand uh, China a little more. Uh, can you explain us what happened recently between China and India? We understand there was some conflict on the borders right uh, there. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah so so there's a lot going on with China especially with the you know the uh, the current premier she's she Jinping as as you know uh, he has been given pretty much a free reign in uh, in terms of uh, you know country's administration and and overall political situation he's is obviously the undisputed leader in in China right now so when it comes to its neighbors uh, whether it's specifically in India and others um, China has been extremely bullish in you know in the border regions um, so you know if you if you talk about specifically with india i mean there was a there was a standoff um, and a skirmish in, in the middle of june um, you know in the ladakh region which is which is the line of actual control it's not really a border so um, you know the border so called border between india and china and that area is called lac which is the line of actual control mm-hmm. and towards pakistan it's line of uh, you know line of control it's loc um, so what it really means is that there's not a defined international border over there uh, there has been a dispute both by china and india in that region as to where the actual border is and you know since the 60s after the war um india and china has agreed to call it lac and basically what it's a demarcated a- a- area where indian uh, troops and uh, chinese troops patrol on a regular basis so what really happened in june was uh, there was a patrol of about 20 soldiers which was uh, doing a night time patrol and these chinese troops came prepared uh, without guns because that's the treaty india and china has, has signed yes and yeah, gushir basically... gushir i i i'm sorry i i i'll still uh, you know we would uh, seek a little clarification here a little more understanding you know which uh, a power military power like china and uh, india being no less of a military power why Why did we have these countries, uh, soldiers fighting uh, with each other with hands? You know, uh, for 
Okay, can you please explain a little more about that? Yeah, so in 1996, there was a treaty between India and China, and the Article 6 of that really defines that, you know, within two uh, kilometers of, of area or from the LAC, so on the Chinese side and on the Indian side, mm -hmm. the Chinese troops or the Indian troops will not carry weapons or use weapons or explosives mm -hmm. or, you know, any kind of combustible material. So mm -hmm. that treaty has actually been enforced to date, uh, with the exception of, of July, um, I think June 15th, where they did not use weapons, but they used something as improvised, uh, you know, metallic handles with nails. Um, and, you know, with, with the, so one of our commanding officers or Indian commanding officer was killed. And, you know, subsequently Indian soldiers went on a rampage and, and killed, um, you know, apparently 45 Chinese soldiers, which China does not agree to. But, you know, China even does not agree to its COVID numbers as well, because being a communist country. So that's what is going on in the Ladakh region so far. So is it just a pure land grab? Is that what China is aiming at? So China has been, if you look at history uh, of India and China, especially with the border disputes, China has been trying to annex more and more land, whether it's Arunachal Pradesh, um, you know, whether it's at, at some of the other bordering states across India, um, and specifically in Ladakh. If you see that, you know, above Ladakh, Pakistan has already ceded a lot of land to China, you know, for its for its uh, Silk Road efforts. And, you know, so so the Galwan region essentially gives a window to, to China to better control that region. Um, because, you know, not not only in terms of strategic importance for military, but also the trade importance and, and, and the Silk Route initiative. So I think China has been doing that for years, not just with India, but, you know, the, India has, you know, for once and after a very long time taken a very hard stand on it and has actually uh, sent a very, very strong message to the Chinese administration that, you know, enough is enough. India is not to be toyed around. And I, I think that was needed. And I think that message is loud and clear for the other partners as well. Indian partners or U.S. allies. Mm -hmm. So, so, so uh, you know, the situation begs for this question. How does U.S. view this escalation? Uh, do, do they take a side on uh, either way? What do they do? I think uh, so, so right after this, uh, you know, I think Mike Pompeo did uh, mention and had a briefing and did support India and its cause. Um, obviously, because one of the main reasons is, uh, you know, Trump administration escalated its uh, uh, offensive, whether it's trade or economic or political with China. Uh, but again, if you look at, you know, the pact between India, um, U.S., and, you know, there's, there's a there's a there's joint Pacific treaty at place between Japan, India, and, and U.S., where, you know, we, we guys are jointly patrolling that area specifically to counter um, China. And now Australia is also involved in that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, to, to understand the whole situation, we, we need to understand, does an army of a country like India, uh, can they withhold against China on their own or do they need collaboration of, uh, you know, all these countries, Australia, Japan, US, to be able to, uh, you know, stand against China? Militarily. So, you know, that's a very interesting question. Is It depends upon really whom you ask. Uh, you know, on papers, if you look at the strength of Chinese military, it is, is actually exceeds that of, um, of India, whether you look at the Air Force, Navy, or, you know, in general, the number of armed forces and, and soldiers they have. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what has happened over the last 15 years or so, even though India lacks in modern modernization, Indian armed forces are on a daily basis engaged in counterinsurgency, whether it's in the Northeast, whether it's Jammu and Kashmir, whether it's, on, you know, on the Pakistan side of the border or whether it's actively engaged in you know with Pakistan so they are well tried and highly motivated you know versus PLA which has not actively seen anything um, and and specifically when you look at look at Air Force or the modernization of the Air Force and the fleets of the Air Force because in today's day and age it's the Air Force and Navy which is going to win you wars and gone are the days where soldiers will march on and, and without any support from Air Force and Navy so even uh, there was a study by Harvard uh, um, you know, a school of government that in today's day and age, if China has to actively engage a country like India in terms of uh, war provocation, I think, you know, the balance is pretty even. You know, you have more technology on the Chinese side, but you have highly trained and motivated soldiers on the Indian side, uh, which has seen a lot of action in the last 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, so, so does does U.S. Uh, as, as is popularly believed, you know, U.S. does joint military exercises with India, and um, you know, the, the, the other uh, uh, countries. India recently uh, acquired Rafale uh, from France. Uh, is there a broader uh, Pacific strategy for for these Western countries, for the U.S., for countries in Europe against China? I think there, there is a broader uh, Pacific uh, strategy when you talk about U.S., uh, specifically U.S., India, and Japan, and, and I think so, um, I think eventually Australia is going to be included. Um, However, that, that started in, in the Obama era, and I think, you know, Trump has done a good job in, in actually, um, you know, extending it. Um, so there is a broader strategy and, at and play. I'm, and I'm sorry, and is India a part of that coalition? Yes, it is. You know, so as part of that uh, uh, treaty, you know, India has also given a lot of rights to the U.S. armed forces in terms of using strategic bases and military installation, whether it's you know refueling or or port of entries and and you know na you know U.S. Uh, Navy uh, vessels ship you know docking and shipping at at Indian ports and Indian Navy installments and and so and so on and so forth. So I think there is there is a strategic, and I think they also renamed uh, U.S. also renamed its uh, fleet on the you know the Indian subcontinent name, you know, specifically to send a message to China, you know, in terms of the coalition and in terms of, you know, the actively engaged, um, you know, engaging these countries. You know, about two weeks back, um, uh, U.S. also deployed two of its, uh, you know, air, um, um, aircraft uh, carrier fleet in the South China Sea, just, you know, giving and sending a message that this remains a disputed area and we do not see to China, um, you know, the South China Sea, where there are almost three military um, air fields which have been actively developed by the Chinese uh, PLA Air Force. <laughs> Yep, uh, we we are seeing these conditions on the ground, but I I wonder if uh, either of these countries can actually afford a war uh, in the present economic situation. What do you say to that? Um, certainly, I don't think anybody can afford a war because you know both are mil uh, you know nuclear armed nations uh, to start with. Uh, but you know uh, the, the interesting thing which is coming out of COVID is that. Uh, if you look at the only GDP which has grown in last quarter is Chinese and none of the other countries. Um, so, so China, uh, and you know, there are a lot of conspiracy theories about COVID, but one of them is is that you know China was well prepared to handle something like that, and none of the uh, other countries were. Mr. So, Mr. Gill, so, Mr. Gill, we will continue on that after a small break to see Vektero the way forward. The way forward is thought of it to Swagata, Math or the host Harjot Singh. Aj Asi Gal Karrea, Sade international expert Gursher Singh Gilnal, President Trump, the foreign policy de Bare, or Asi Sabtu Pella Sabajna Charea, China Nu. Gursher. So, uh, before going to the break, you were talking about uh, all these conspiracy theories that are related to uh, China, uh, particularly, you know, in light of uh, Corona and COVID. So, uh, the important question is, how is the world going to react to this corona situation, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis their manufacturing capabilities, both with respect to essential items, such as ventilators, which could not be availed by many countries at critical times, and other, uh, you know, regular items as well. I have not been able to get a bicycle for myself for two months now. So, um, do you think the world is uh, going to uh, take uh, another look at at its policy of moving its entire manufacturing to China? So, uh, Arjun, long-term answer is yes. I think this has done a lot of damage to to, to China's reputation um, in terms of, uh, you know, helping and supporting and really calling out the COVID situation uh, <laughs> quickly, you know, for the world to get world to get prepared or react. Um, but in the short run, uh, you know, uh, we are also dependent upon China. Uh, you know, U.S.'s uh, trade deficit stands at 400 billion. 
um, you know, so so how do you how do you bridge that overnight? It, it's going to take years to either find another manufacturing partner or multiple manufacturing partners or build in, internal capabilities, and that goes for India as well. I mean, you know, uh, you have seen, you know, Mr. Modi in India has declared, um, you know, a self-reliance and moving away from Chinese manufacturing, and also banning about 50, 59 Chinese apps. Um, you know, citing the security re uh, reasons. But, but again, you know that that has started, um, you know, a thought process, um, you know, in 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 one of the biggest, uh, actually the biggest democracy in in the world. So I think, you know, whether it's U.S. or India, or whether it's, it's the European nations, or whether it's the Middle East, or whoever it is, I think slowly they'll realize that, you know, China is going to become a bigger threat because we are just feeding their their political and their military establishment by buying more and more from China. So is China is in indispensable at this stage or we already have seen this manufacturing going to other countries we hear that the biggest beneficiary of this whole corona situation have been countries like Vietnam like Malaysia where, where companies have actually moved their manufacturing uh, units you know so I used to work for uh, you know um, um, I think the number two apparel and footwear company before called VF Corp uh, till about two years back and we had manufacturing based out of China mm -hmm. and we also had manufacturing based out of Vietnam and 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 Bangladesh and some of the other countries. So yes, um, uh, I think there is going to be repercussions. A lot of uh, American companies which do leverage manufacturing, a lot of brands specifically, or or you know whether it's iPhones or the bigger brands as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it cannot be done overnight. I mean, this you know the moving manufacturing capabilities and finding the right sourcing partners takes months or years in some cases mm -hmm. uh, because you know you have to adhere by a lot of uh, you know, U.S. norms and regulations in order to get certification to be a, you know, sourcing partner for U.S. companies. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, but, you know what, I, I think this is a big wake-up call mm -hmm. for corporate America, for, for you know, the Congress or the government of the uh, United States and many other governments across the world. And I, I think that I'm hoping that this will fuel in a way where a lot of, uh, you know, nations across the world will start supporting some of the other countries mm -hmm. Which are not as as bullish as China, whether it's it's, it's military-wise, whether it's geopolitical ambitions, um, whether it's you know currency malapination and, and and so on and so forth. So um, I think you know uh, to answer your question, yes, it will trigger, but it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. See, so the important question is, uh, you know, we understand that the, the the corporate world, the companies then uh, in in themselves might be, uh, you know, willing to find uh, new partners where, where the, so that they don't run into these problems that they run this time. But the question is, is there going to be an action at the government level? Is, is at the policy level that uh, do do we need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, decrease our dependence on China? Do you see anything like that happening in the near future? Not just by so, U.S., by other so European countries. just to give an example countries. that, yeah. uh, you know, if you have to uh, source something from China mm -hmm. for the EU, mm -hmm. um, you have you used to have about you know five to seven percent on apparel and footwear back in the days. Um, I don't know what the right number is right now because I'm out of their industry. But they used to exempt countries like Bangladesh because of uh, um, you know a, a poor economy and and you know not so de developing economy. So you know steps like that. So if U.S. has to actively respond or take actions in terms of finding new manufacturing partners across the world, mm -hmm. you have to first address the duty rates you know so and if the duty rates are favorable for companies i think the companies will move out quickly but you know what um, the gap of 400 billion dollars it's, it's 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 you know it's going to take years to fill do, do you see uh, uh, the reaction of uh, companies and governments uh, directed by anger towards china because of how they have handled this corona situation so not in U.S. Everything's driven by results on the Wall Street. So, uh, so you know, so uh, so I don't think that uh, it's going to be emotional. It's going to be led by um, you know policy uh, decisions by the government mm -hmm. and favorable policy decisions by the government. And and subsequently, um, you know, uh, if, if the quality of, of of products and services are equivalent or better in other countries, I mean, yes, the, the, the companies will be motivated to 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 you know step out and and look for better partners in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you see. Uh 
Uh, one of the very really popular uh, slogans by uh, President Trump has been America first. And a big part of America first has been, uh, you know, President Trump's uh, actions against China. People, people perceive, people said that it's not easy to stand against China and no one other than Trump would have uh, stood the way he has stood. Can you tell us exactly what Trump has done uh, to, to uh, you know, enforce what he said uh, would be, uh, you know, standing against China? What, what exactly is his policy against China? So, so I, I think that a lot of Mr. Trump's uh, policies are driven and are centric towards his, his his supporters, specifically, you know, if you look at the farming base in the in the Midwest of the country, in the south of the country. So he's, he's definitely, you know... Did, the, didn't the, they the, hurt the farming community by all those tariffs? Well, well, you know, uh, so so in some cases he has reached out to China and asked uh, the Chinese government to up the you know farming uh, imports from the United States, but but that, that's not what we're discussing. We're discussing the larger policy. So I think you know tariffs have certainly been you know in favor of the United States, uh, but again, um, I think the lack of overall strategy mm -hmm. uh, to address. Um, you know, either the Chinese, um, uh, you know, might of of commerce and and military has uh, has you know not helped the United States cause. I mean, case in, case in point. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at John Bolton's book, I mean, he has cited several instances or instances. Now again, it's it's his opinion, and 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 you know, some people say he's done it for money, but uh, but in some cases, um, you know, he's called out Trump's policy as being you know impulsive and to help his uh, re-election campaign. So, and um, you know, in, in some cases, uh, you know, you have a lot of political insiders uh, who say that um, you know more could be done. Like, for example, um, you know, uh, there was uh, Muslim suppression in in, um, in China, and nothing has been done. Uh, no active uh, steps have been taken. Uh, there's uh, uh, you know, the, the, the lot of uh, you know currency manipulation is the other one. Um, but again, you know, there's a lack of overall strategy to counter mm -hmm. China. And, and I think it's more impulsive. It's it's more driven towards a political gain. It's yeah. not, um, you know, um, not what, what what's going to yield, uh, you know, a 10 to 15 years long term um, strategic um, uh, solution for the United States. But 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 uh, Gosher, uh, when we talk uh, of China policy, I think uh, what what uh, this administration advocates they have done is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, putting those tariffs. Have those tariffs helped in any way, even uh, in, uh, by bridging uh, the international trade deficit? Have those tariffs helped? So it hasn't helped with the deficit. Mm -hmm. What it has done is 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 twofold. One, maybe it has uh, generated additional income for the government, which which I think it has. But you know uh, the the incremental um, tariffs is, is also you know as a result being passed on to the consumer. So so for example, you were talking about a bicycle to buy. Mm -hmm. If you if if you have to land a uh, you know a bicycle from China without tariff, is is going to be less money to you. It's going to cost you less. Yeah. But eventually, you know, the consumer has to pay the buck for it. So so yes, uh, I I and think that it may hurt in in the short run, but it's going to hurt both the United States and and China at the same time and, and, and besides that like companies like apple they move their manufacturing you know pointing case uh, apple 11 from china to india because you know china uh, products in, are in china are being you know there's sure. a tariff uh, imposed on them then um, you know uh, china was importing a few things from us like soya beans and they started importing it from brazil so i am not sure if those tariffs have uh, directly helped but we will talk more about this after a short break to see Vectero the way forward. The way forward is Toda Fertu Swagata, Matoda host Harjot Singh. Aj Asi Gal Karea, President Trump, the foreign policy, the uh, foreign expert, uh, Sadar Gushir Singh Gilginal. Gushir Jithe Apa uh, Trump, the policy, the Galkiti, vis a vis China. Just make uh, you know adversary. Uh, 
बट कुछ लोग क्वेश्चन रेज कर दें अबाउट प्रेजिडेंट ट्रम्प्स हैंडलिंग ऑफ रिलेशन विद आर अलाइज एज वेल रिसेंटली वी हैव सीन विड्रॉल ऑफ यू नो नेटो ट्रूप्स फ्रॉम जर्मनी वी हैव सीन इशूज विद नेटो फंडिंग सू दसोगे कि साढ़े अलाइज के नाल साढ़े जो रिलेशन है हाउ हैज दैट वर्क अंडर प्रेजिडेंट ट्रंप एंड इज देयर एनी ट्रूथ टू दिस सम पीपल अलेज दैट यू नो प्रेजिडेंट ट्रंप इज प्लेइंग एट प्यूटिन हैंड्स सू दसोगे समथिंग मोर अबाउट दिस so uh, to start with uh, as you may um, agree or not agree but my opinion is that you know uh, mr trump has a certain amount of infatuations with the, you know dictators or strong men personalities whether it's putin uh, whether it's erdogan in turkey whether it's um, you know xi jinping in in china mm-hmm. so um and, and, and he has hinted postponing the elections this year as well so I know, yes i mean <laughs> yes. talk about that uh, but besides the point um uh, if you if you see that um you know over the history of the last one year or two years or three years of administration mr trump has tried to mm-hmm. to reverse every possible policy of uh, mr obama mm-hmm. and and uh, you know mr obama enjoyed a very good relationships with with the you know nato members specifically you know united kingdom germany france and 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 some of the others mm-hmm. um, um mr trump is not a, a particularly a big fan of of uh, the german chancellor um we all know that and um, you know but but one of the things which which i agree with mr trump is that um as per the nato agreement um all members have to spend uh, 2% of the gdp for nato forces mm-hmm. uh, don't get me wrong nato is thriving you know as a matter of fact nato has upped its budget in the in the last 5 years mm-hmm. so it's pretty strong by any means the defense budget of nato is only second to united states it's at about 300 billion and that's far exceeds any other country except for united states so it's extremely strong mm-hmm. however you know countries like germany has not uh, put in you know 2% of of um, of the gdp which is uh, obviously a tricky point with mr trump because he has one reason to not get along with with the german, uh, german chancellor merkel um uh, so out of the 29 nato members only about 8 or 9 countries uh, actually hit the 2% spot mm. and united states actually funds 3.4% of our gdp and 70% of the military spending for nato which is quite a bit mm-hmm. uh you know this this demand for increase in their budgets uh, you know for this uh, member states has been going on forever uh, even president uh, obama made that, uh, those demands several times but has trump been able to achieve that have they increased their budget actually I don't think he is I I I I believe he has not uh, I don't think that Germany has increased its spending and dramatically or anybody else mm-hmm. uh, but in the larger context we need NATO more than uh, you know uh, more than uh, any time in, in in the past right right now you have aggressive Russia you have aggressive China mm-hmm. um, you know everybody is uh, you know these two countries are are trying to you know eat into um, you know every place um, or country uh, which has a strategic importance to the united states so you know there's increased involvement of russia and middle east and europe across poland there are sorties going on by by military aircrafts on a daily basis across alaska poland finland name it right and and russia's involvement in the middle east whether whether it's a syrian conflict or north africa whether you know libya is a case in point and and china is also becoming extremely bullish so you need nato more than ever right now and i think this is not the right time to have that kind of discussion i think that you know nato discussions are better to be held in closed doors mm-hmm. because of the strategic importance of of nato overall mm-hmm. so so what would you say to that allegation that president trump has been playing at putin's hands do, do, do you give any any uh, to that there is a certain amount of truth to it uh, mm-hmm. i don't know the reason why but you know whether it's ceding ground in syria or pulling out troops uh, us troops from germany mm-hmm. uh, is is uh, directly playing into their hand 
and uh, you know also there were talks about reducing troops in Afghanistan and and you know we all heard about uh, you know the Russian bounties on on US soldiers and uh, Trump hasn't addressed that with with Putin or other government of Russia so 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 I think there's a certain amount of truth to it I don't know the reason why but but I think that uh, um, he, he doesn't want to address it the, the bottom line is whether he's doing it intentionally or otherwise Putin is definitely benefiting is that right to say absolutely mm -hmm. uh, you know the other uh, Question I would like to ask you, President Trump had appointed uh, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, uh, as in charge of the Middle East policy. How do you think that has worked out in the last three and a half years of his administration? I think in terms of selling equipment to the Saudis, it's worked pretty well, and to UAE, it's pretty well. But in terms of uh, achieving something strategic uh, in, in Middle East, nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. um, Neither has he been able to resolve the dispute with Qatar or, or you know, any other strategic initiatives, whether it's the Palestine-Israel conflict. Mm -hmm. um, nothing has been achieved. I, I think that it's definitely benefited, in you know, uh, in some cases to, for you know for for U.S. companies and defense uh, suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, I, I think you know, in strate strategically speaking, nothing has been achieved on ground. Mm -hmm. You know, again, he's pulling out from. Syria. Uh, that 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 um, we, works directly to uh, you know, the benefit of the Russians. I, I don't know uh, how how deliberate is that, but uh, maybe it's uh, you know in line with his uh, uh, you know declared policy that he would uh, reduce American interventions uh, in in foreign lands. Do you see it that way? Um. I think it's it's also to do with uh, his re-election. So you're right that he that was one of his, his points he ran on. So I think he's trying to fulfill that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's more than what meets the eye. All of a sudden, we were we were highly involved in the Syrian conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, you had U.S. aircraft carriers launching missiles on on the Assad administration, and and within a couple of years, the entire chain, uh, you know, tone has changed, and you're pulling out troops, and you basically vacated Syria and the ground. You know, we were supposed to support our our partners over there, the Kurds, and you know, we left them hanging. So what are, what is the message we are, we we are trying to send in Middle East that yes, U U.S. will is is your partner. We are there to support you, but you know, depending upon the administration, we can just leave you in the lurch. It has to be consistent across, mm -hmm. um, you know, different administrations, and and you know, we have lost a lot of ground and and face in the Middle East because of that. Yeah, I, I believe that's the way it has always been, uh, but uh, maybe prior to this administration. What's what's going on in Libya right now with the Russians and the Turks coming in? So. Um, well, Libya is an interesting place. I mean, with the fall of Gaddafi, I mean, there are basically two powers at stake. You know, one is the the uh, UN. Um, accepted and approved government, mm -hmm. um, and the other one is is actually being supported by Russia. And interestingly, that you know, that uh, that that side of Libya, which does not control Tripoli, um, is is I think Mr. Gharat is, if if I'm pronouncing it right, he's the leader of that. And and, and Mr. Gharat has been supported actively by Russia and interestingly by France and and some of the other countries, including Saudi Arabia and UAE. As well, on the other side, you have this UN-led, uh, you know, which rules uh, Tripoli, which is called the G GHA or GAH. Um, uh, that is supported by Turkey. So Turkey is uh, also getting more and more involved, um, you know, in, in Libya, and so is, is Russia. So Russia is training one side, and Turkey is training the other side, mm -hmm. and the conflict is going on. So it doesn't necessarily help the the local people over there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if this uh, all can be seen as part of uh, America first policy or it should be seen as a withdrawal of American leadership from uh, you know the world stage we uh, can't overlook other withdrawals uh, from from uh, you know world uh, treaties like the Paris climate treaty and now World Health Organization Iran nuclear deal. We will talk more about that after a short break to see Vektero the way forward. 
द वे फॉरवर्ड थोड़ा फिर तो स्वागत है मैं थोड़ा होस्ट हरजोत सिंह गुशेर another uh, area where uh, you know president trump claimed some early success uh, was north korea can you tell us what's going on with north korea so nothing has been uh, achieved uh, there's nothing concrete which has been achieved with north korea i mean we i think mr trump had, had uh, multiple uh, um meetings with uh, the uh, leader of of uh, democratic apparently democratic republic of north korea mr kim jong un mm-hmm. uh, but um in terms of whether it's uh, it's is uh, agreeing to dismantle their so called nuclear capabilities and development of nuclear weapon or or you know a, a more harmonic relationship with south korea and the neighbors mm-hmm. uh, there's not really anything um, you know on document uh, so um, uh, with the covid breaking out i think north korea has taken a back seat and and with with china being the forefront forefront of the international policy mm-hmm. uh, we are not seeing uh, many activities i mean the recent activity was um north korea destroyed the building where they jointly used to have uh, meetings with south korean leadership mm-hmm. uh, as a message that they don't want to engage south korea again uh, so uh, the, the, you know the regime still is very elusive you don't know much about it you don't know what's happening over there and very uh, unpredictable so so i think is there uh, is there a known breakthrough the current administration can be proud of with north korea yes nothing nothing uh let, let's move on to iran with the exception of exchanging uh, friendly letters mm. uh, and you know dennis rodman going into the country and playing basketball i i don't think there's anything else yeah that that's an achievement in itself uh yeah. when, when we talk about uh, about iran you know we have seen uh, president trump dismantling uh, a lot of structure that president obama created whether it was uh, you know uh, paris climate uh, change uh, the treaty or this iran multilateral treaty you know we have seen that in domestic policy as well but but when it comes to uh, international policy that was uh, a signature international uh, achievement for president obama and uh, it is claimed that uh, iran has been adhering to uh, you know the terms of the treaty but president trump uh, withdrew from that treaty uh i don't believe that he has replaced it uh, with uh, anything else how is uh, that withdrawing from the treaty working out with iran i think it was more symbolic um and the fact that uh, the other repercussions is that we still impose sanctions on iran and iranian companies mm-hmm. um and us companies are still not allowed to trade with iran or in iran so you know essentially uh, that's a loss for united states uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know economics uh, but the treaty i have not heard anything differently that this treaty is still not in place i think the other members of of this treaty which is joint comprehensive uh, plan of action mm-hmm. and the permanent members of you know uh, you know un um, apart from united states which is russia china uh, france and uk and and, and Germany as well um they are still adhering to to this um, this treaty and and as far as uh, uh my knowledge goes yes there are expiration dates of when the treaty expires and by when i think 10 or 12 or 15 years when when you know um, uh, beyond that uh, iran is allowed to enrich uranium for the purpose of uh, defense uh till then uh, i i think that uh, you know the rest of the parties are still adhering to to that treaty you know that that presents uh, a very uh, you know a new situation at least uh, since the uh, post second world war uh, world where america has led the world you know it has provided leadership um, to, to the two countries across the world and what we see here at least in this situation is um, you know america withdrawing uh, from that treaty but the other countries whether it be russia or even the uh, european union they have continued with the treaty and uh, you know it's claimed that uh, iran is still uh, adhering to uh, you know the terms of the treaty uh, even when uh, us uh, has withdrawn we have seen such withdrawal of leadership uh, by us and uh, withdrawing from uh, 
Paris uh, Climate Treaty. I think India, uh, U.S., and only one one of the nations, some some South American nation, uh, with only two nations that have withdrew from that treaty. Now U.S. has withdrawn from a World Health Organization as well. Do you uh, see some uh, long-lasting repercussions of this withdrawal uh, from leadership role by America? There could be. Um, if Mr. Trump comes to power again, uh, it, it could be a long lasting repercussions. But I believe that if, if the Democrats come to power, they're going to change that. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, we, we're going to be sitting back on those tables uh, and re-engaging the world and, and important institutions like WHO um, if the administration is changed. I mean, you, you, you have to give Mr. Trump some credit that, you know, he, he, he vocally says he does not believe in science and, and you know, the climate change. And he believes that, uh, you know, windmills cause cancer and stuff like that. So he's he, he talks the, the talk and then obviously backs it up with action. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, long term, if, if Mr. Trump's come back, uh, Mr. Trump's party and, and him, he himself comes comes back to the power and, and remains president for another four years, then yes, we could we could lose a lot of ground in these areas and in these uh, parts of the world. Yeah. Um, but uh, if, uh, if, you know, 4th of November is going to decide a lot for this country, I guess. Uh, uh, Mr. Gushir, you know, it's, it's very important important for us to uh, understand when uh Trump uh, says uh, America first, and a lot of supporters say, yes, we, ha we need to think about America first and not about other countries. When U.S. intervenes in you know, foreign countries, is, it, is U.S. doing some kind of charity or is it some kind of, uh, you know, uh, their own military or business interests that America is serving? It could be both, but it, it's not completely, you know, uh, uh, bereft of uh, all U.S. interests, is it? It really depends upon, uh, you know, the countries and areas and, and, and this thing. So I think it's it's not true. It's not a blanket statement for everything. Mm -hmm. um, more to do with America first is, is uh, you know, it, it's a right-wing wave across the world. I mean, you know, India saying India first, Russia saying Russia first. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, this thing is, is UK first and is withdrawn from, uh, you know, EU. So, so you are seeing this wave across the world, I and mean, Brazil is case in point. I mean, uh, you know, the president of Brazil did not believe in COVID, and he got COVID. I mean, uh, he says Brazil first as well. So, I mean, and Mexico is another case in point. So, a lot of leaders, right wing leaders, are are you know are riding on that wave, mm -hmm. and you have seen that uh, increase over the world. So, um, I, I think I, it's more to do with political gain than anything else. So, you think this this rise in uh, you know right wing uh, this nationalism is is that uh, does that have more to do with the moving of the uh, manufacturing jobs you know uh, outside the borders of these nations or it's more of an identity issue uh, which you know these people are worried about I think it's both. Like, if you look at U.S., I mean, uh, uh, you know, me, people like you and me, we are immigrants, and we have come and, you know, enjoyed the American dream, and we continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, uh, people were worried about losing jobs to immigrants, and and obviously uh, the advent of technology made everything easier for the companies to outsource it to, to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, Mr. Trump and come, has come in and stoked that fear uh, mm -hmm. and and the rise of white um, nationalism and uh, white supremacists is one example of it. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, I think that uh, um, the core of, of, you know, the America was founded on immigrants. So so I think the core is uh, still very strong, and I think we're going to ride this wave. Uh, but again, uh, you know, you're seeing this happening all across the world as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, nobody's to be blamed. I think it's it's the time and age mm -hmm. of technology, and, and you mix it up with, with, with the kind of jobs which are remaining in the U.S. You see a lot of blue-collar jobs getting outsourced, and it's easier to outsource mm -hmm. even more with the COVID situation. And, and and uh, the penetration of education and society um, in, in America is still very less compared to the rest of the world, and specifically, for, you know, compared to the European countries. 
uh, you know, with this... When I'm uh, in education, it's the college education, not the high school education. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with this, uh, the, the present world with greater connectivity, uh, you know, with in this globalized economies, uh, the world is uh, standing at a threshold where, you know, uh, it can take either path. And, uh, you know, we all have to be very careful with uh, which way we want the world to go and we are part of that decision that that is why it's very important for all of us to make those informed choices uh, uh, in our you know national uh, elections in our uh, local elections not just in this country but across the world uh, mr gill thank you very much for taking out the time today to speak with us uh, you know we will be reaching out to you in the coming days uh, especially uh, with a very important election looming over our head. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for so much for today. AC Sada Ajda episode. The way forward dekhanda. Bohat bohat shukriya. Ajda na milange agle hafte. Tusi vekte ro. The way forward.